Well, welcome. Good evening. This is Argonne National Laboratory's Virtual Out Loud Lecture. I am Leslie Crone, Argonne's Chief Communications Officer, and I am pleased that so many of you have joined us tonight. Let me begin with a few housekeeping notes to help you all get the most out of tonight's event. We are using the BlueJeans platform for this virtual event. It does work best in the Chrome browser. So if you have connected using another browser, you may want to exit and reconnect with Chrome. Your video and your audio were automatically turned off when you joined the meeting. However, there are a few ways you can talk and communicate with us, and we do encourage you to do so. First of all, if you have questions related to the technology of this meeting, for example, if you can't hear the presenters or see our slides, please use the moderator chat feature and we will help you troubleshoot. This private chat may be accessed by clicking the gray icon on the right of your screen that looks like a talk bubble. To ask questions throughout the event, please use the Q&A module by clicking the square icon labeled Q&A. In this feature, you can pose new questions or you can upvote questions asked by other attendees. By upvoting or liking a question, People like me moderating the questions will be able to see which are of most interest to most people in the audience. And we will have a Q&A period later in the program when we will answer as many questions as we can. Participants can turn on closed captioning for this event. In the lower left side of your screen, there is an icon labeled CC with a blue outline. Click on that icon and three moving dots will appear on the bottom center of your screen. Closed captioning will then appear. To turn the captioning off, click the icon again. And please note, this is only available if you have logged on with your computer, not if you have joined via cell phone or another mobile device. And please also note, the computer is generating these closed captionings, and so some names, abbreviations, and other words may not generate quite correctly. Lastly, please note that this event is being recorded so people can view it later, and it will be posted. By participating in this session, attendees consent to being recorded. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our laboratory director, Paul Kearns. Paul has been with the lab for a decade. Under his leadership, the lab has flourished in no small part due to his understanding of the importance of an inclusive and supportive lab culture where scientific discoveries and breakthrough technologies are generated and celebrated. Paul, thank you for being with us this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leslie. And let me add my welcome to our uh, virtual out loud lecture. I am Paul Kearns. I have the honor of serving as the director of Argonne National Laboratory. Since Argonne's beginning in 1946, we have unlocked new science frontiers and solved big, challenging, complex problems for our country. We accomplished this mission with our diverse, world-class community of talent who represent a wild, wide variety of backgrounds and expertise from across the country and around the world. We are committed to increasing diversity across the lab as we build the pipeline for the next generation of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics professionals. Critical for this effort is reaching out to diverse communities, people who are underrepresented in our field and who embody exceptional insight, drive, and talent. Tonight, we have a special guest, uh, someone with an outstanding record of supporting diversity in the sciences. Over the years, he has developed programs and established organizations that increase the representation of African-American men and women in science and technology. As Argonne's first African-American laboratory director, serving from 1979 to 1984, Walter E. Massey created opportunities for African-American scientists and engineers while providing support and leadership for the funding of major research facilities, including securing the initial funding for the U.S. Department of Energy's advanced photon source at Argonne. He continued these efforts as the director of the National Science Foundation. Walter provided leadership and mentorship to educators and students while serving in academia as provost and vice president for academic affairs at the University of California system. President of, president of his alma mater, uh, Morehouse College, president of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and board chair of the City Colleges of Chicago. He has also made significant contributions while serving as the boards of major multinational corporations, including McDonald's, BP, the Tribune Company, Motorola, 
Amico, and Bank of America, where he rose to board chairman. And on the board of uh, philanthropic organizations such as the Mellon Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Museum of Science and Industry. I'm honored to call Walter one of my predecessors. I'm pleased to have him with us tonight to discuss how we can promote the inclusion of more African Americans in the science. It is now my privilege to welcome former uh, Argonne Laboratory Director Walter Massey. Welcome, Walter. Glad to be here. <laughs> thank you. Virtually at the lab. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back virtually. Uh, let me ask to start, uh, when was the last time you were actually on campus at the laboratory? I think the last time I was there was 2016 when we had the, uh, was it the 75th, I believe, 75th anniversary. And there was a symposium uh, on the history of the lab uh, where they invited back all of the uh, former directors living. <laughs> uh, Bob Zimmer, President Zimmer chaired that. And we had a wonderful discussion. And at that, I noted that uh, at that symposium 2016, that marked the 50th anniversary of my association with the lab. Yeah. Yeah, I believe the first time you were on the Argonne's campus was in 1966, uh, and you were serving as a fellow working with a uh, research team. Do you remember what research you were involved in at that point in time? Perhaps you could describe your first experience at the lab for us. I came to the lab in the spring of 2000, I mean, of the 19. 66 as a postdoc fellow. And I had a, a joint appointment in chemistry in what was then the old solid state sciences division, which we changed when I was director, combined other programs made in material sciences. And I was a theoretical physicist. I had been doing work on superfluid helium, part of my thesis. And I was in, I, uh, asked to join as a theorist in an experimental group headed by a chemist, Bernie Abraham but it was a joint program in solid state and chemistry. And they were looking at uh, anomalous phonon dispersion in liquid superfluid helium, looking at scattering of sound waves. And the experimental results did not uh, match up with any of the current theories of how sounds should be uh, propagated in, in liquid helium at those temperatures. But I was also able to continue collaborating with uh, one of my colleagues who was in at University of California, San Diego. And one of the really nice things about being at the lab then was I was allowed to do that. I was pretty much allowed to work on what I wanted, you know, in addition to working with the group. It wasn't until much years later, not that many years, three years later, four, when I was at Brown that I finally uh, came up with the theory along with a colleague, Humphrey Maris, that really explain those anomalous phonon dispersion results in liquid helium. Mm. But argon is a great introduction to, yeah. to, to uh, argon for me. Well, your patience and persistence paid off in terms of understanding the science, that's fantastic. By any standards, your career is exemplary and can be characterized as trailblazing by a series of firsts. Among them, you served as the first African-American professor of physics at, at Brown uh, University first African-American president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the first African-American chairman of the board of the Bank of America, and, of course, the first African-American uh, laboratory director at Argonne. With these positions came uh, well-deserved uh, prestige and recognition. Undoubtedly, they also came with uh, many pressures and challenges. Uh, perhaps you could recall uh, for us some of your biggest challenges and how you overcame them in these various roles. I could go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> Big challenge. <laughs> I have my, one of the uh, major ones was by uh, being selected as director of Argonne. When I was asked to be director and I accepted in 1979, I had never managed anything larger than Dean's office at Brown. <laughs> which had uh, less, maybe about 100 people, a small budget. And then the next thing I knew, I'm director of an institution with, uh, I think, about over 5,000 5, employees and a budget of over $400 million. We had Argonne West then in the reactors, so yeah. the lab's probably about the size bigger maybe than to, today. 
And at, so I had to learn that. And a month before I was selected, Three Mile Island, the incident happened there. Mm. And almost, the, almost meltdown. And so nuclear power and nuclear energy was thrust in the forefront of national political uh, discussions and debates. And of course, Argonne, that was our legacy program and our premier program at that time, as I said, because we still had reactors out at Argonne, out at, in Idaho, National Engineering Lab. So suddenly, there's a theoretical, many body physicists, former dean of the college, having to learn all about the social and political issues of nuclear power, and also learn a lot about the engineering and physics of nuclear reactors, of which I had, you know, undergraduate understanding. The other big, and I, I, I managed to learn a lot. I was on a steep learning curve, but I had great colleagues that I got. And Chuck Teal, who was head of the uh, in, uh, nuclear research, uh, nuclear power research, what do we call it? Nuclear energy research Div uh, director division was just fantastic. The uh, other major, big challenge I had was that uh, when I was director of NSL, to try to get funding for LIGO, which is the laser interferometer uh, gravitational wave observatory that most people will recognize as the instrument that first detected gravitational waves almost to the year, a year, 100 years after Einstein predicted their existence. And one would not know it now, you can go back and read the history, that project was the largest project in the history of the NSF up to that time, and it was opposed very strongly by the majority of the the astronomy community at that time. So in order to get funding for that, I really had to work hard with Congress and the scientific community to overcome the objections to get funding, first of all, and then to overcome the objections on the science from the astronomy community. A bit, another payoff of that was uh, when I was invited to the Nobel Prize ceremony in 2017 by the physicist that won the Nobel Prize, and I was recognized as having contributed to their success by them. That really was a big deal for me. A non-science related uh, challenge is, uh, was becoming chairman of Bank of America in the midst of the major financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And I don't have time to go into all those details, but I have written a memoir about that. It's called In the Eye of the Storm. My time as chairman of Bank of America in the midst of the nation's worst financial crisis. So those are three I can think of. Well, very nice. Thank you for sharing. Uh, just a small sample. I'm, I'm confident uh, I have picked up a copy of uh, In the Eye of the Storm, and I'm uh, I haven't completed reading it just yet. But I was really fascinated by what you had written about Argonne National Laboratory and becoming the director there, Walter. So. Thank you for taking the, the putting your energy actually into the, uh, writing, uh, preparing the memoir. Very helpful, inspiring. Uh, throughout your career, you've always paid it forward, as is made evident by your longstanding commitment to expanding opportunities uh, for minorities and women in science education, increasing diversity in the sciences, and improving the quality of the science education on the national level. Share with us your pathway from doing full-time research to your engagement in these areas, please, and why you've made it one of the hallmarks of your careers, your career, please. I, I left Argonne in 1968 to go to the University of Illinois Urbana uh, for two reasons. One, it was a fantastic place. Then it was the best condensed matter theory group in the world, headed by John Bardeen. That's why I was very pleased to be to be asked to join. However, that's not the main reason. The primary reason I went was because I felt since 1968 that being at Argonne, I was doing, doing well. I just got promoted to that staff scientist from postdoc. But I was just I was doing my research. I enjoyed it and I'd drive from Hyde Park. I'd do things when I came back. But I felt I was being left out of the important issues of the civil rights movement, that I was not contributing much at all except maybe doing my research and maybe being, I wasn't engaged. And a lot of the action, you might say, was on the college campuses in the late 60s. And so I wanted to be on a campus where I thought I could make some other contribution besides just doing research. That's why I went to Urbana. And I got very involved in issues there. I became 
first uh, first night I was there, they arrested 250 black students, and that I got involved in those issues. I uh, became advisor to the Black Student Association and then became the founding chairman of the Black Placard and Staff Association. And there I got interested in science education because many of the students, uh, minority students, black most of them, who had come, came from Chicago, Philadelphia, there's a story behind that. And they were not prepared to take those college level courses and the, the university was putting in remedial courses. So I thought I could contribute by being more engaged in science, pre-college science education. I left Urbana, I went to Brown, and I was, helped start a program called Inner City Teachers of Science, ICTOS, to try to train individuals, encourage them to go into teaching in inner city schools. And I, with some colleagues, devised a new physics course that combined physics and teaching in school. I came back to Argonne. Uh, I really wanted Argonne as director to be more uh, be more engaged in outreach and education. Mm -hmm. So we en enhanced the division of educational programs. DEP was called then, and uh, we mostly in the Argonne neighborhood. But we made some forays into the city. And, and Leon Letterman, who was then director of Fermi, and I and a small group of others were instrumental in founding IMSA. Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, which is doing fantastic now. So I spent a lot, and I could go on, I spent more time then at the NSF and at Morehouse, uh, really trying to do things about in, to improve science education, the pre-college level, and also at the college level. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I had not heard the story, really, of how you got engaged, really, in the education and really promoting, if you will, a uh, uh, better education at, at the college level. So thank you for sharing that, Walter. Uh, very meaningful. So you were the founding chairman of the National Society of Black Physicists and an advisor for the formation of the Society of Physics Graduate Students. Uh, these organizations were established to promote the professional development of black physicists and enhance the number of African Americans entering the field of physics. How important are professional organizations to the development and advancement of African-American career scientists? Oh, I think they're extremely important. They were very important back when Carl Spite, Jim Davenport, and I started the uh, National Society of Black uh, Physicists. When I, when I received my PhD, I think I knew every black PhD physicist in the country. We all knew each other. That's how few that was. And so we started that organization to try to promote programs and develop programs to get more blacks in physics, but also to provide a space, an opportunity for blacks in physics to come together and work on issues together. And I am just pleased how far that organization has come. Still around, doing well. And our <laughs> interesting story, the now president or the chairman, I'm not sure his title, is a professor, a black professor at Brown, Stefan Alexander. Uh, and I was at Brown when I became the founding chairman. So now Stefan is there. And um, Jim Gates, Sylvester Gates, prominent theoretical physicist at Brown, is the uh, president of incoming, maybe already now, of the American Physical Society. And I think that's wonderful because it's important that we have those places where you might go to discuss issues and provide uh, develop programs among yourself. But it's also important that we participate in and try to influence activities in the traditional mainstream physics society. Yeah. Well, very good. I often talk about the importance of community at Argonne, really pulling together uh, towards a common objective and, and could really uh, associate with what you're sharing in terms of professional organizations. Thank you. Got one more question now before we turn to the panel. And, and obviously, your, your contributions, your achievements are numerous. You've achieved, achieved so much in your career, Walter. Uh, is there anything you haven't accomplished that you'd, that you'd like to do at this point? Yes. I'm chairman of the board of a consortium that's building what we hope 
So it will be one of the world's largest telescopes, building it, building it in Chile. It's called the Giant Magellan Telescope. And one of the things I really would like to see accomplished to be around is to uh, have us finish that telescope. We're about halfway through be another five or six years before first light. And I would love to be there to see first light and to be able to get those results back from the study of exoplanets, among other things, to see if we can detect signs of conditions that might be uh, appropriate for life as we know it. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow, yeah, really uh, a great science, uh, complex project, and a great collaboration with many other uh, institutions as well. So I'll look forward to following, yeah, very complex. Look forward to following the development of the Magellan, giant Magellan telescope. Walter, let me say thank you for sharing your reflections and the insights you've shared this evening. Your leadership uh, provides an example. Uh, it is an inspiration for anyone who wants to use their platform to make a difference and leave an institution better than when they arrived. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, really value our relationship, and uh, view you as a mentor for me uh, personally, Walter. So thank you for your guidance, your encouragement along the way as, uh, for, as a colleague. Now we've come to a point in the evening where I turn the program over to you, Walter, as uh, the lead a discussion with uh, three uh, scientists who are opening doors for the next generation of African Americans. When the discussion uh, concludes, I'll be back with a special announcement. Walter, please. Thank you, Paul. So we will uh, begin a panel discussion. I will moderate. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, I'm not, what, am I on? According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, statistics by 2024, science and engineering occupations are projected to grow by 28%, with the computer science uh, field forecasted to yield over 1 million new jobs and the engineering field uh, following close behind. However, even as these employment opportunities are just over the horizon, African Americans pursuing undergraduate degrees in engineering, physical sciences, and mathematics are not increasing at the rate we need them to. For the second part of the program, we want to consider the current status of African Americans in science and engineering and discuss what should be done to address their persistent underrepresentation. Joining me for this discussion uh, is a distinguished panel of scientists who I am pleased to introduce. Brian Nord, Dr. Brian Nord, a scientist, is a scientist at Fermilab and the University of Chicago and director of the Deep Skies Lab. Dr. Nord has worked on computational and observational cosmology for over a decade, contributing to our understanding of dark matter and dark energy. Most recently, he has focused on the development of statistical learning algorithms like artificial intelligence in an effort to fundamentally change the way we make scientific discoveries. Also, for over a decade, Dr. Nord has been working to create just and equitable research environments, either through institutional committee work or through activism-based approaches outside traditional avenues. North co-organized the June 2020 Strike for Black Lives and co-authored the July 2020 Change Now Calls to Action from Black Scientists at Fermilab. We also have Dr. Rochelle Burks, Associate Professor of Analytical Chemistry at American University. Her research centers on developing field portable sensors for detecting samples of forensic interest, including explosives, chemical weapons, and illicit drugs, and latent prints. Dr. Burks is also a popular science communicator, often combining pop culture and chemistry. She has appeared on documentaries, podcasts, large genre conventions, and television shows, including the Science Channel's Outrageous Acts of Science and the Smithsonian's channel Curious Life and Death. Last year, she received the American Chemical Society's Grady 
this uh, 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 award. And we also have, and now I have to find my section here. Oh, Dr. I should mention by Dr. Burks. I just learned before we came on that she is uh, featured on a wonderful film. It's called uh, a, a uh, Picture of Scientists. Look it up. I just did. It's, it's, it's marvelous. Also joining us is uh, Dr. Jatia Hart. Dr. Hart is a nuclear engineer leading intelligence programs in the Strategic Security Sciences Division here at Argonne, where she directs analysis of WMDs, emerging technology, and energy security to inform national security decisions. She left Argonne in 2015 to serve as the intelligence briefer to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy and managed a portfolio of foreign nuclear programs across DOE National Laboratory. However, she returned to the lab, for which we're all grateful, in March 2019 to serve in her current position. She is passionate about outreach to undergraduate groups in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Her efforts are supported by the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and her latest project, STEM Queens, is a web-based series for black girls showcasing African-American women in scientific and technical fields. And you can Google that. You should really look it up. So I'd like to thank each of you for participating this evening. So let's get started. Uh, as a recent study published in the journal Educational Researcher, which found that white, Latino, and African-American college students entered science or do enter science and technology programs at a roughly equal number. However, the retention of those students presents a hurdle. About 37% of Latino and 40% of black STEM students uh, switch fields. They left, left as undergraduates. And that's compared with 29 or less than 30% a white STEM student. In addition, research supports that racism and misogyny are key barriers to the pursuit of careers in science for uh, underrepresented minorities, African Americans specifically. So, how do, a question: How would you suggest we address these challenges inside the STEM and research environment? And I'm going to start with you, Rochelle. Don't mind. Surprise. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this is a really complicated question because I think it also depends on which institutions we're talking about. Are we talking about primarily white institutions, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges, um, Hispanic serving institutions? You'll see different measures. You'll see different numbers. I, I suspect these numbers are from either averaged or primarily white institutions. That being said, however, the composition of administration, of faculty and staff can often not reflect the community of which those personnel serve. So one question, of course, if you were to do a full audit would be, what are the programs in place? What are the systems in place at the institutional level which seem to discourage continuation. Um, but also we need to ask is what else is going on at a bigger level? One of the main contributors of lack of, of, of not being able to continue isn't actually personally driven and isn't perhaps to deal with these other, it's financial. And we can't separate oftentimes the lack of generational wealth, um, mm -hmm. which of course we know is also tied to gender is tied to race. These things are linked and intersectional. Um, and so we have to talk about what else is going on. The sheer amount of financial debt that Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic students go into, they may take breaks. They may have to get out sooner and switch majors to do so. There's so many layers. So as an institution, looking at financial aid, looking at the, the level of, of lo private loans to federal loans, looking also again at institutional programs. What are the programs doing? Are they actually encouraging 
and supporting success or are they acting more like gatekeepers? So I think we really need to take a hard critical look at ourselves because if you keep bringing in more people and keep hemorrhaging them out and the turnover is high, if you are a corporation and educate, you know, an organizational psychologist would be like, well, clearly you're all trash. I mean, they wouldn't say it like that. I don't think they would, but they would be very critical of the culture of the corporate environment. And we're not a corporation. We're, we hope to be better than that. So what, what we have to still with that critical eye, I think, what is the failure here? What are we failing to do and failing to provide? And it's tough to do that. Brian, do you want to follow up on that? Oh, Question? thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Rachel, for that. That was great. Um, so we talked about opening doors and walking through them um, and holding them open for people behind us. And I think one of the things that I struggle with is when I walk through the door of an institution, do I feel like I can bring my whole self? And what the reason and the reason I say no a lot of the time or I have said no a lot of the time is that I don't think that a lot of my colleagues um, who don't experience systemic oppression who and who have not worked with, say, earlier career scientists who experience and suffer from systemic oppression, I don't see them doing or for the longest time, I haven't seen them doing the work of understanding how these systems work. And so when I say. You know, when I say justice for Brianna and justice for Reinhold, because that like because my week was wrecked because I had to deal with that outside the walls and I, I bring that in and people don't understand that, that's a barrier for me, for them being able to understand who I am. And so I think racism and misogyny can be they are parts of this bigger picture that have to do with policy. Um, and they are part of how people consider their everyday lives inside institutions and how they treat us and being aware of what what everyone is going through. Titia, you want to come in on, on this question before I move on? Sure, I'll, I'll just very quickly say because uh, mm -hmm. Rachelle and Brian have covered this pretty yeah. well that yes, it is a societal problem and it's not something that you can cherry pick and, and just solve. But I think if we're really thinking about how at the institutional level, we really need to talk about devoting resources to the problem and also having accountability. So everybody, you know, has a diversity and inclusion program, but a lot of times what I see that is missing is the resources to support a program like that. Um, the example I give is safety. So every institution has a safety program and they put real resources and they have smart metrics behind those things that people are held accountable for. But I'm not really seeing that so much uh, in the DEI space. So I think that's a concrete thing. I mean, again, it is a larger problem, but that's a place that we could start. So what would you recommend? I mean, you sort of implied solutions, especially Rochelle, about the institutions really taking, really having to think through seriously what it is we're trying to achieve and what it is we can do and how we're going to do it. And I like that corporate uh, analogy <laughs> in terms of accountability. And so if you were making recommendations for how these institutions, let's now assume you're a person inside institutions, what kind of recommendations would you be making to these organizations to affect change in these areas from the inside? And I'll just keep with you, Jatia. Well, Dr. Massey, it sounds like you just put me in charge, so I'm just going to go ahead and. Uh, <laughs> well, you're a nuclear I, engineer. I know you guys. <laughs> I, I never, I've never shied away from being in charge. So, um, in my head, what I would do is, um, I think we have sort of taking our eye off the ball. Um, I think there was this era where when President Obama was in office and we had his administration, we got we got comfortable and we kind of took our eye off the ball, our foot off the gas. And I think we stopped devoting resources to those sort of things and thought everything, you know, post-racialism. Um, and I think really people bought into that. And 
I think we really need to put it in place like it is another key issue in a business. It shouldn't be like a nice to have, a something you throw a little bit of money at and that is, you know, variable year to year. That's not how you sustain something. So I think that, yes, there needs to be resources. And I think that if you have leaders and you have employees and diversity is a key component of your company values, then when you go and do a performance review, you need to have a metric that is measurable. Um, you need to have a fully developed, implemented plan. You need to have a DEI um, program that doesn't rely on volunteers. I know a lot of companies have volunteer programs, a lot of research institutions, um, but that's a lot of unpaid work that, you know, the people who love this work want to do this work, um, but they don't get anything in return. I mean, they have that personal satisfaction, but literally they have to take away from the mission that and the work that they were paid to do to do this labor of love um, and get no recognition and no, you know, kind of job um, integration with that. So that's one thing. Uh, th those are the two things. And it's always my soapbox. So I was ready for it, Dr. Massey. You let me know when you want me to jump in again, but I'm going to give uh, everybody else a chance to chime in. I know it's Michelle smiling at that. And I'm, I'm going to go back to your corporate analogy. And the corporation, corporations can make the case for diversity as a part of their central business mission, right? They can really justify, and not just justify, but take it on to say, we need, our business needs to reflect our customers, they need to reflect our, the marketplace we're in, et cetera. We want to get talent. What's, what's the, what is the argument you give for diversity in science beyond the social equitable, social equity issue? What is the argument for science itself and engineering for well, the need for diversity? And, and Jatia, you can't jump right in. I go to two at the top. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I've stopped giving justifications. And I would ask in return is, why do I need to justify being here? Who are you to tell me or ask me? why I get to be here. We've, we, we, I really do think that we have to get out of that justification because if we keep reducing, especially black, indigenous, Hispanic people to their labor, to what they can uh, uh, give us, where are we again? We have got, you get to be here. This idea that why should we let you in? What's the benefit for me? What are we doing with that, right? You, we have got to get out of that. The other thing is, is that science is a human endeavor. And, and that's the beauty of it, right? It reflects our brilliance. And of course, it reflects our bias. And when we do it well, and I think this year, as hard as it has been, has showed how well we can do science and how quickly. But as Jatia said, when we throw our might behind it and we're serious with our allocation of resources, whether it's the most brilliant minds, whoever they are, wherever they are, the world over. And we throw every dollar, pound, yet. I mean, when, when you, we can get it done. And we can do it from zero to market in nine months, right? So, I want to see that for this. And we haven't yet. But when no. we're serious, we will match the resources with the rhetoric. What you say you value better have a budget line and it should be permanent or you don't really value it. I've gotten real stone cold in my own age. <laughs> <laughs> Old age. <laughs> she makes me laugh. <laughs> you weren't born when I became director of art. <laughs> <laughs> that might be true, sir. <laughs> how, Brian, how do you talk to young people uh, about of reasons for going into science. What, 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 what do you say to them, to those you encounter about why this is good, even with all the problems we're talking about, that this is a field worth pursuing, they should pursue? Um, I guess I, I don't come to it with that ansatz that anyone should pursue science as uh, 
as something that you know is is something that inherently they should be doing. I think that everyone should have access. I think that everyone who um, everyone who finds interest and finds passion in it should want to do it. But I also don't find science to be an exceptional form of the pursuit of knowledge. I think that humanities, um, uh, sociology, economics, like every all other things that we that we pursue and that we that we pursue in in the name of improving the world, those are all worthwhile avenues for um, for study and 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 they all they all have these they all have these issues that white supremacy exists everywhere. And so I so I don't I wouldn't give different advice, I guess is what I'm saying when it comes to when it comes to existing in the world, because th this the world is what it is. And academia, STEM, all uh, these are not special, exceptional places. Um, and so I, I do think that that is something that we suffer from as a community, uh, particularly, I would say, in physics um, and other hard sciences, where we think that we're special in some way. We think that we're objective. We think that we're at the top of some pyramid of knowledge. And I think that we need to slow our roll and understand that we're part of a web of knowledge and a web of learning and humanity that um, that needs to value all these things and bring them together so that we can so we can be part of something bigger. So and and I will also say to them, there are not very many of us, but there are more than there were before, and I will be there if you need me. Um, but I, I don't tell people that they need to do it for some reason. They need to do it if they want to, and um, and I and I, I don't sugarcoat it. Like it's gonna it's gonna be hard, most likely. Michelle, you are just smiling and laughing there. <laughs> well, I think that, you know the advice. I give similar advice. Um, I'm glad mm -hmm. I got a liberal arts education, but also, you know, I, I my advice too to students is they're separating the job from your discipline. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked in a crime lab. I've been, I'm now an academic. When I was in college, I worked full time um, in a retail store. There's, there's your discipline, like in science, right? But then I might, you know, I moved institutions this year. You might move jobs and the workplace might be great or the workplace might not be great. But my love for chemistry is completely separate from the workplace. And I really, I have to tell students sometimes is that the love for your discipline or your area, if you can find a way to keep that separate from sometimes the drama, the 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 emotion, whatever is happening over in a workplace, that will really help you. But sometimes when they get too blended, your your aggravation and your frustration with the workplace, I don't want it to diminish that joy you get out of doing this discipline or this scholarship and sometimes i think that that happens to us all where it kind of leaks over so i i really try to say you know hold on to the love of this this thing whatever it is whether it's law whether it's art whatever but know that the jobs they come and go some might be good some might be not so good um, and i i think that that actually hopefully helps my students retain some of that joy of, of whatever it is that they, they love, no matter what the discipline. Wonderful. So, and I don't know where we are on time, but so we've talked about changing from the inside and uh, questions of how you talk about science as a career, how you talk about life, as Brian and you said, as uh, what, you, what one wants to seek in terms of their own growth, personal and intellectual. What about strategies that you think are effective or you think should be used to change from the outside? And Brian, let me start with you because you've been working on trying to do things from the outside. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that, if, so if you look at the research in equity, diversity, inclusion in organizational science journals um, and sociology journals, there's there's not a lot of evidence that like diversity and inclusion as it's been framed for decades has has figured anything out about how to change things and and we can see that from these numbers right um, I as far as I know I'm literally the second uh, black male to be tenured scientist at Fermilab in a 60 year history and the previous the first one 
um, retired just as I was coming on as a tenure track scientist. So they're replacing us at one a generation. Um, the, the situation isn't really different at University of Chicago and, and things like that. So I think that data shows that like institutional, like strictly institutional avenues have not proven that they that they need to do something. I think the first thing to do is is to remember that, is to remember that the institution will not save us. That's not that's not the point of the institution in many cases. And so um Remember, and remembering that we have some individual and collective power outside of institutions, I think, is the next step. So what does that collective power look like? I, I think, again, that, that I think we need to think about who knows how to put pressure on our institutions. Um, for example, Hispanic and black women, uh, genderqueer black people have been doing activism outside institutions for decades. Like, it's not like they wrote a book that we can just repeat, but they, they figured out a lot of things that we can learn from. Um, and so I think we need to turn to expertise outside of where we sit. So like as a physicist, I'm not, I'm not gonna reinvent a wheel about how to put pressure on an institution. So yeah, I'm thinking about social scientists, gender and women's studies scholars, critical race theorists. Like this is scholarship that like can undergird efforts to, to teach an institution what it needs to do differently. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say is what I think this means is, and, and, this, and I, I would say that these are things that I use in service of or in application to activist efforts, um, like the strike for black lives and things. But, um, and, there are, and there are lots of black women who are doing this work right now that we, that we can be learning from, like Jedida Eisler, Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, lots of people. Um, sorry, and the last thing I'll say is because there are so many people doing this work outside and they are, many of them are early career scientists. We need to pay attention to the new ideas that they're bringing and not assume that the people who are higher ups in management and organizations know what they're doing if they keep using the same ideas. Katia, want to weigh in on, on this? What do you, what, how can you, that change Absolutely. from the outside? Hmm? Absolutely, you know I have something to say, uh, Dr. Massey. Sure. So I, I, I had some, my first thing is, as far as an outside force, um, I am really big on um, media and changing media. Reality is perception. People learn a lot from, you know, people learn a lot from how to treat people they don't know about from media. So I think that's one way that we can uh, kind of alter um, outside forces. And I had some success with this this summer. I was uh, on a reality TV show, Survivor, and there were a couple instances of how um, people of color were treated on the show. And really, we went straight to their bottom line. I mean, mm. money talks. And so we really, you know, appealed to their bottom line, looking at their audience, their viewership, their sponsorship, and giving them a business case for change. So um, I think, yes, there is a way to go at it from a social kind of uh, a strategic way, but also you need to sh tell people that it is also good business, um, literally good business for you to diversify and for you to change. Um, again, this was at a time where there were a lot of social uh, unrest. And so if they did not implement you know, different uh, tactics that everybody else was doing, they fell behind as a company. Um, and we started a social media campaign and, and met with the president of CBS. And we did that this summer and they rolled out some new uh, CBS diversity uh, guidelines this fall. So it, it can happen. Um, it's not easy. Uh, sometimes you have to have the, the wind blowing in the direction that you'd like. Um, but I think we do need to continue to pressure. I think we need to work collectively. And I think we do need to um, look at the bottom line um, when we and, and the business cases. Um, diversity of thought is a, is a huge business case. If you want to solve the world's hardest problems, you have to have a breadth of ideas that um, come into it. You can't just have the same people from the same group having the same thoughts coming from the same schools because you're going to get the same answers. So. That's one of the business cases that we can make in academia and research. Hey, Dr. Massey, it's just, it's just Leslie, you had asked for a time check. You've got about five more minutes on the panel before we uh, move into Q&A. Hey, Michelle, you want to 
take the last shot at that question? Just going to, you know, both, I think both um, of the previous speakers, Jatea and Brian, um, I'm really lucky at American, uh, you know, we have the Anti-Racism Research and Policy Center, and I, you know, defer to my colleagues. Again, I think, you know, Brian is absolutely right, Jatea, is that we have so much expertise in our institutions, um, whether academic or, or otherwise in community activism. Again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I'm lucky to be a faculty affiliate for the center here because I can just, you know, contact a person who I know works in, in levels from grassroots all the way to huge, you know, international coalitions um, to, to affect change. And, you know, and then, of course, there's even more specialty. I love, you know, there are whole, you know, specialty sociologists that study us, the sociology of scientists. And their subculture, there's the whole specialty of that, the dynamics that go on there. And I think, again, we can pick up a lot of those, those, those tips. And, and the same thing, you know, with business cases, I think. And I really love what you said, Brian, about I know we think we're, I know that <laughs> we think we're real special. But there are lots of great expertise, you know, across the quad that will, will really be useful to us. Um, and so, I think that that's been a real benefit for me is is picking up more humanities, um, reading those journals. I've been doing a lot of my own work with uh, experts here on um, restorative justice and truth and reconciliation, and how to. And then, of course, you know, grassroots activism, because you know, again, there's there's a reconciliation that needs to occur and accountability. But how do you actually do that? I have no idea. Luckily, I have people who do. <laughs> so. So that's been really beneficial. Well, I think it's been a wonderful discussion. I must say, it's so hard and inspirational to see people of your generation really so engaged in this. I was on another Zoom this morning, the NSF sponsored interviewing young scientists at historically black colleges and universities. Some of the similar questions came up and just to see so many fantastic young African-American scientists and engineering now who are not only doing great science, but really trying to advance social issues in new ways. It's just was a heartwarming. So thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. I hope the audience enjoyed this. And I think, Leslie, I'll turn it back over to you. All righty. Well, first I would like to thank you, Walter, Rachelle, Jatia, Brian, uh, your discussion has generated a lot of comments in the chat and a fair number of questions in our Q&A. So uh, we are going to tee up a couple of minutes here for, for questions and answers. So for our audience, uh, if you have any questions, look for the Q&A icon and type in your question. Uh, if you like questions someone has already submitted, please click the like button and it uh, filters those up to the top. And we have about eight or ten minutes for questions, and so we'll do as many as we can. Um, so uh, the most popular question here, Dr. Massey, is really for you. So I'm going to go to you first. Um, and the question really is, you have made found numerous ways to make contributions as a scientist, an educator, a manager, as a role model for over 60 years. To what do you attribute your versatility and your ability to make those contributions over a sustained period of time? My wife. <laughs> Okay, can we all have her number, please? <laughs> but, you want uh, to elaborate? Played, yeah, actually, she has played a big role. Uh, I think a lot of what I've been able to do, really, this, I'm not being trite about it, has been serendipity and being fortunate to sort of have opportunities open up. But also, I think early on, after I really stopped doing research full time, got into areas where I was in science policy, science management, I really dis discovered that I liked working with people, that I could accomplish things by working with people and through people, that people liked working with me, people liked working for me on issues and in organizations. And also, I had a great curiosity about learning new things and wanting to try new things. And so I was willing, with the support of my family and wife, mentors, to move into other directions. That's when I decided that 
I was doing research and I enjoyed it. it had, I did have a real passion for it, as Michelle pointed out, but I felt that there were other ways I could do things and learn and grow. And when those opportunities opened, I took the risk of changing directions. Great, good advice there. All right, one more question for you, Dr. Massey, and then I'm gonna send a couple to the panelists. Um, can you describe a sacrifice you had to make early in your career to get where you are today? Oh, early in my career, I was very fortunate. I went to Morehouse College. I was in 10th grade in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where I grew up. And Morehouse really started me on my path in, in life. And taught, I taught me so much other than give me a grounding in science and math and physics. Uh, I left physics at Argonne, probably the first time. I loved research. I could I could have stayed at Argonne the rest of my life just doing research. But maybe maybe I could have become director of Argonne if I stayed at Argonne, did research. I wouldn't say I'd had to give up anything to get where I am, but I had have had to change directions. When I went to Urbana, I took about a 30% salary cut from Argonne to go to work at the University of Illinois. But I felt I wanted to, as I said, be in the cauldron of uh, social issues of that time. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, I've got a question for our panelists. And I actually am going to ask each one of you to respond to this question. And it's really, you know, are there organizations or institutions that you know of that are doing a good job of fostering a truly inclusive environment for their students and or their employees? And for for what can we learn from them, really? That's the question. So I will call on Jatia first, uh, in no particular order. Sure. Um, so in hindsight, I, I really thought that my undergraduate college uh, did a great job. I, I went to Florida State University for undergraduate, um, but we had a joint college with Florida and m Agricultural and Mechanical University. And I guess I didn't even know how good I had it when I was there, um, just because we had a lot of support, not only in the classroom, but the understanding of the unique challenges that uh, come with being an African-American student, with being a female student. And we actually had um, a Center for Academic Retention and Enhancement that kind of was our home away from home because um, they knew we, we needed that. Um, and I think that HBCUs as a whole do a good job of understanding that it's a unique environment to you may be the first person in your uh, family to go to school. Um, STEM is a whole different animal. Um, so that's a unique, they know you may not, you know, have money to get home. You may not have money to take an internship, these sort of things. And I think they try to nurture their student body a little bit more. Um, and I think there are definitely lessons learned um, that could be adapted into other spaces for that. Understanding that undertone of privilege and um, support that uh, majority students have and majority uh, employees have that uh, minority employees and underrepresented groups may not have. Great, thank you. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, I would say a little bit outside, more to a professional organization. Shout out to all my fellow Sakanistas, so SACNAS, the Society for the Advancement of Native Americans, Chicanos and STEM. Um, I think it's, you know, I've been a, a Sakanista for a long time. Um, I think they do a great job of, you know, of course, pursuing excellent science and excellence as individuals and bringing your whole self. Um, and I think that the, the environment is just unlike any other um, professional society. Probably maybe uh, Nobuche would be uh, another one that I would put in there. But again, a space that really is about um, really being considerate, kind of getting to Dr. Nord's point of, of feeling comfortable and bringing your whole self and, and then including your excellence as a scholar, but who you are as a person. So I think uh, SACNAS as a professional org would be right up there. Okay. And Brian, what about you? 
Thanks. Um, I, I guess at the scale of institutions and organizations, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in different places, uh, you know, over the years visiting for colloquia and, and visiting with people, working with people. And I got to say, I haven't seen an institution or organization that I can say, yes, does a good job on the whole. Um, what, what I think at, right now, because I think that's the case, what I think we need to look at is what are the groups, you know, so, say the research groups um, led by one or more PIs, what are the departments, which ones of those are doing, doing things well? Um, and I think we're at that level of granularity because, you know, if, if our institutions were doing something, I feel like we would hear about it more because if they were doing something that was changing the game, they would want to be telling people. And we're not really hearing that, that we're not hearing about the evidence that they're changing the game. Um, so, so I would look at that. I also would look at um, some student organizations at, at institutions um, that are thinking about how to how to participate in a model of shared leadership in institutions. So there's this thing called, um, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's DATs, which is it's a way for uh, a really clear partnership between, um, say, faculty in a department and, and, and students to guide the future development of those, of those spaces. So, um, and I guess the last thing I would say is, I think we wanna reevaluate the meaning of inclusive um, and inclusion and how how that actually sort of sets a boundary between people that are inside and outside and what are we asking people to do when we say we want to include you um, maybe the question we want to ask is how do we build community together okay thank you all for those insights all right i'm going to do a lightning round on our last question uh, our particular question from the audience so uh, we're going to go pretty quickly to everybody and uh, the question is if you had one thing you could do to change K through eight education that would impact STEM in high school, college, industry, and research, what one thing would you change? And maybe try and keep your answers to about a little longer than a tweet. So um, I'll give you all a minute to think about it. <laughs> and then maybe we'll go in reverse order. I'll start with Brian and then go to Rachel Jatia and then give Dr. Massey the final word. So Brian, what would you change in K through eight education? In a tweet, um, the AIP team up report calls for more black professors and scientist professionals for uh, undergraduates. And so I would say we need the same. Um, I would say we need the same for K through eight. We need more people for people to recognize as, um, yeah. Okay, Rochelle. Decouple property values from how we fund schools and fund There's them tweet. instead on uniformity across the board, we'd see a radical change. All right, Jatia. You can tell Rachelle yeah. is an expert tweeter. Um, I would say yeah, give them more hands-on experiences so that they can understand what a STEM career actually is. Okay, and Dr. Massey. Maybe your father call me Walter. Everybody out here has a PhD. Why do I get singled out? <laughs> uh, in a tweet, I would combine those three answers. Okay. Well, Great answer. <laughs> I, very good. Um, so I, I would like, again, just to say thank you to everybody. Um, that's going to conclude our Q&A. Um, thank you. Dr. Massey, Dr. Hart, Dr. Burke, Dr. Nord, <laughs> and our audience uh, for all your contributions to the chat and to the Q&A. Um, we've had some lovely comments. I hope you have a chance to go and read them. Uh, I'm going to turn the program back over to Paul Kearns. I'd be Dr. Paul Kearns. Um, and uh, he has an, imp uh, an important announcement to make. So, Paul, please. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. Let me thank uh, also, Walter, Brian, Rochelle, and Jatia, very thoughtful, uh, very thought-provoking conversation. I've been taking some notes and, and have some ideas, and we'll be following up as well uh, to really kind of further those, my thinking. Uh, thank you, really, for sharing this evening. I want to say that Walter is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary degrees that underscore, underscore his distinction. So before our program concludes, the Argonne community, 
would also like to recognize Dr. Massey for his many contributions to creating a more diverse scientific community. I am pleased to announce the establishment of the Argonne National Laboratory Walter E. Massey Fellowship. This new prestigious fellowship will be awarded to outstanding scientists and engineers from underrepresented communities who have recently received their PhD or in the process of completing their degree requirements. The fellow will be hired as an Argonne Scholar and will engage in research with our world-class community of scientists. They will receive a highly competitive salary, full benefits, and a stipend for research support. And the fellowship will last for three years with the possibility of joining Argonne staff afterwards. We intend to have our first Massey Fellow on board by this October. This fellowship was created by a team at Argonne who took the lead on developing and establishing it. I'd like to acknowledge the Argonne, Argonne's African American Employee Research Group uh, for their efforts in this regard, really showing uh, great leadership in, in making this happen. This includes Justin Bro, Harold Thompson, Jared Hampton Marcel, and Jatia Hart, who spearheaded this effort. Harold Gaines and Arista Thurman, the president and vice president of the Employee Research Group, and Philip Anderson, the director of the Argonne Leadership Institute. I'd also like to recognize uh, Tina Henne from the postdoctoral program and Vivian Sullivan with the lab, lab directed research development program who joined in the development of the Walter E. Massey Fellowship. Walter, uh, this is one addition to your legacy at Argonne. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We are grateful for your service and your many contributions over the years. At this time, I welcome you to say a few words on this special occasion. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and I want to thank all of those who were part of creating a step, helping to establish this award. This is one of the most significant honors I have ever received. It brings together many of my passions and engineers, enhancing the research base at Argonne and nationally, and promoting diversity and inclusion in science and engineering and at Argonne. I never imagined when I arrived at Argonne as a fresh postdoc fellow 50 years, over 50 years ago, that there would someday be a such a prestigious fellowship named for me. And as I understand it, there's only one other comparable fellowship at the lab named for the Nobelist Maria Gepard Meyer. And that's certainly great company to be in. I think given the discussion we've had, it's interesting that you have the two fellowships, one for a female and one for an African American. I want to thank everyone who helped make this happen. I won't mention the names since Paul has mentioned all of you individually. Uh, I thank you very much. I'm looking forward to meeting the fellow when he or she arrives, hopefully at the lab in person. I do want to give a special thanks to a person who has worked with all of us in making sure we pull this off uh, the way I think it's went in a very professionally organized way. And that's Robin uh, Grange, Robin Wheeler Grange, who I warn you is a harsh taskmaster. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Walter. I think that brings us to the end of our forum. And definitely my thanks to Robin and uh, the other folks on the communications team at Argonne who have made this event uh, such a wonderful, uh, wonderful evening. So uh, I'd like to thank the participants, everyone who joined uh, and engaged in our conversation. Uh, we did record tonight's session. Uh, we will email a link so that you can watch it again or share that with your uh, colleagues, your friends, your family. Our next Out Loud lecture will be held in April, so look for an email with an invitation with additional details. I hope you have enjoyed your virtual visit with Argonne tonight. Please stay safe and have a pleasant evening. Bye-bye.